At long last, the new war has raged throughout the Origin system, bringing with it permanent change as well as questions regarding the future. In this video, I will detail the events leading up to the new war and throughout the quest, as well as some minor speculation about what the future holds, namely, what may come with the Duviri Paradox. Though the quest itself begins somewhat abruptly, the seeds of the conflict have been germinating for some time. Therefore, the best place to start would actually be right after the sacrifice quest. With Ballas having successfully reverted the Lotus back to her identity as Nata, he has also, seemingly, become her captive. Though this will later be revealed to be a ploy, he continues the act and reaches out to Arteno, granting them the paracesis in the hopes it will put them and Nata at odds and sever the connection that she has to them the first step in his plot to complete his mental manipulation of Nata. Should the Tenno attack Nata, it will loose the final bond she has to anything or anyone other than Ballas, and the Paracesis would be enough of a threat to motivate Nata to act in self-defense. Granted, this doesn't fully come to pass, but it serves as an example of another of Ballas's many plots. Additionally, we see that with Ballas' hybridization and direct link to Nata through his eye, they have become connected inextricably, and he will later use this connection as yet another vector with which he can exert control over Nata. Nata then utilizes the sentient creature known as the Ropalolis to bait the Tenno and gathers critical information about them that she will later leverage in the new war. Gathering their forces, the sentients begin to amass their armadas in the far fringes of the Origin system. It is here where the Tenno first received the visions in the Era prologue, and see him seemingly struck down by the Lotus in the past. The sentients then begin their first minor assaults across the system during Operation Scarlet Spear. These small-scale attacks can be assumed to be probing for weaknesses, as well as gathering information about where the Unum might be located on Earth. The sentients then begin to examine the Origin System's spacefaring capabilities with ship-based incursions, and also utilize the sacrifice of the Ropalolis to deploy the Murex forms, now designed to render warframes inert. Though these assaults are repelled, the sentients have now gathered the intel they desired, and prepare for a full-scale assault. Era urges Nata to take up the mantle and reactivate the mothership Pragasa, revealed to have died or gone dormant in the ages since the Old War. This calls into question how canon the Warframe trailers are. As in an earlier trailer, Nata was seen to be speaking to Pragasa. If that was indeed canon, then it can be assumed that Pragasa was near death and finally expired off-screen from what is the sentient equivalent of old age. With their mother's reactivation, her final work can be completed, though the ramifications of this will not be apparent until the finale of the New War quest. However, with scattered memories of the past still lingering within, Nata hesitates, remembering that she had struck down Era long ago. Era then forces her into the core, reactivating Pragasa and initiating the New War. It is here we learn that though Era appeared to have perished on Lua in ages past, he survived. It can also be inferred that he was rescued by Ballas, who was eager to find more contacts within the sentience he could control and manipulate. Why Era joins with Ballas is likely due to his discontent with the sentient's slow and largely ineffective long-term plans, as well as a sense of debt to Ballas if he was indeed rescued by him after his attack on Lua. Ballas, always a man of grand ambition, entices Era to his side with the promise of a grand and sweeping takeover of the Origin system, as opposed to the slow and methodical waiting game played by his father, Hun Hao. The Origin system, scattered and divided, is woefully underprepared for the full-scale unified assault of the sentients, which is swift and sudden. A shaky, desperate alliance is formed, but it is not enough to repel the might of the sentients and the ancient powers of the Orokin in tandem. For with Ballas secretly working behind the scenes, he has granted the sentients insight into another tool, Temple Kuva. A brutal strike on the Unum allows him to harvest her ancient Kuva and weaponize it. 
As described in the ancient legends of the Ostrons, Temple Kuva allows for control and manipulation of living things, and while once used for benign purposes, it has now been twisted by Ballas into a tool of mass control via the veils. In the heart of Pragasa, Teshin initiates a solitary strike to disrupt the Warframe nullification fields, but fails. He is captured and struggles to resist the control of the veil placed upon him, but is killed by Era for his defiance. Nata, drained after being used to reignite Pragasa, is kissed by Ballas. As Ballas is now part sentient, it is likely that this was done to take whatever mechanism allowed Nata to control Pragasa, putting the mightiest weapon in the system under his control. Convinced that he no longer needs Nata, and that he can be satisfied with an empire all of his own, he activates Pragasa to open a portal to the void, and sends the Lotus and Arteno into its depths. An unknown amount of time passes, and Ballas has leveraged the sentient fleet and his supply of Temple Kuva to bring the Origin system to heal under his new empire of Narmer. The Grenier, Corpus, and remains of the Tenno have all fallen under his might, and been forced to hide throughout the system. The power of the Veils and the corrupted Temple Kuva have brainwashed the system into falling under his manipulation, forced to relive warped and twisted memories that paint Ballas as their savior. However, we then discover that though our operator was consigned to the Void, their alternate timeline counterpart has been deployed in our stead, and has also brought the Void-scarred Eidolon of Nata with them. Why the Drifter has been sent, I will address later, but for now I will continue with the quest's plot. The Drifter fights from the shadows, undermining the Narmer Empire as best he is able. It seems that Ordis is aware he is the Tenno, but due to him being unable to comprehend the exact nature of Eternalism, he struggles to differentiate the two. The Drifter first needs a Corpus shuttle to break through the outer cordons of Narmer control, which sends them to the Valis, now moderately more terraformed in the time since the rise of the Armor Empire. Here the Drifter dons a Narmer veil to enter the factory unobstructed, but is able to withstand its control for various reasons. Not just through sheer willpower alone, but due to the fact that the veils, powered by Kuva, are somewhat obstructed by Eternalism. As Kuva is tied in some manner to the timelines of a given universe, it targets what it believes to be the original thing of that universe, and thus attempts to subsume the Drifter with memories and emotions that are instead catered towards our original Tenno. This mismatch in temporal identity is enough of a disruption to the Veil's methods that the Drifter is able to infiltrate the Veil factory and escape with the Corpus shuttle in tow. The Drifter then seeks the help of Hunhao, who, while still trapped beneath the oceans of Uranus, has nonetheless been aware of his son's actions and the manipulation of Ballas. Hunhao agrees to help the Drifter in the hopes of rescuing his daughter Nata, and returning his son Era back to his embrace, away from the lies and control of Ballas. Hunhao briefly mentions that the Archons similarly wish to revive the dead, though is slightly cryptic on what exactly this means. As he also mentions that they are already searching for the remains of Nata, it can be assumed that Era simply ordered them to find her and revive her in a manner where she will be returned to the fold of the Narmer Empire, and not given a chance to break free with the Tenno. Hun Hao guides the Drifter to the locations of the Archons, Warframe sentient hybrids developed by Era and the Old War, and instructs the Drifter to kill them and steal their cores. These cores can be assumed to be either a corrupted or hybrid form of Oro, or, far more simply, empowered sentient cores, which can then be given to the Eidolon of Nata and return her to full strength. These cores are likely what allows the Archons to manipulate the Warframes they puppet, essentially hijacking the Warframes aura, which is more potent and powerful than the ones the sentients normally possess. Shortly after meeting with Hunhao, we are shown the first of several flashbacks to the time aboard the Zaraman, and given some critical information into how the systems of time work within the Warframe universe. For the sake of keeping things organized, I will address all of these flashbacks and the information within together. The first minor bit of information is the true name of Gomaitru of the Entradi. Before she lost her memory and named the Infestation, her name was Euleria Entradi, daughter of Albrecht. 
We are then given by far the most important set of information in the entire Warframe narrative thus far, the concept of Eternalism. In a prior video, I had conservatively assumed that time was a myriad of infinite possibilities, but only in the future sense, and was collapsed into a single reality upon its realization. However, Eternalism presents that the truth is far more complicated and involved. All time, in all directions, from all points is valid. Everything that can, has, should, will, or might happen, has, hasn't, won't and will. While this is somewhat confusing, the important takeaway is that the Warframe universe is one comprised of infinite multiverses. More specifically, the Void is the grand total sum of all these infinite multiverses, a vast ocean of every reality and timeline twisting and churning within itself, an infinite archive of all the Void watches, and all that could the Void dreams. We are then shown that during a routine jump test with the Reliquary Drive, the legendary catastrophic jump near Saturn occurs, and the Zeraman is lost within the Void. Forced to hide from the now insane adults of the crew, the children are visited by the aspect of the man in the wall. He, quite appropriately, accepts Arteno's offer of their light, and in turn offers us an exchange. He will grant the Tenno powers to survive the Zeraman, but at a great and unfathomable cost. The exact ramifications of this cost are abstract and complicated, and will no doubt be explored deeper in the Deviri Paradox, but my current understanding is thus. The Man in the Wall essentially collapses all realities of the Tenno into two. The one that escapes the Zeraman and becomes the Operator, a multi-dimensional being that swaps its own temporal reality at will, essentially becoming an unaging, undying, physical manifestation of the Void itself, and an anchor for whatever creature truly exists behind the Void's twisted facade. And the other, the Drifter, the Tenno that is doomed to live forever within the Void aboard the derelict Zeraman, a pawn and a chess piece of the Void itself and one that may be among similar company within the plains of Duviri, locked within a temporal prison of some kind, in an island of reality within the void. The man in the wall then extends his hand, which has been replaced by the severed hand of Nata that was cut off earlier by Ballas, in some sort of chronological joke or insult, and Arteno, desperate for a way out, accepts it. With the choice made, the now impossibly limited timelines of the Tenno diverge into the two we are familiar with, the Drifter and the Operator. It can be assumed that with our Tenno agreeing to the deal with the Man in the Wall, the fate of all other Tenno aboard is identically sealed, thus revealing that our Tenno is responsible for the fate that all others would share. As an aside, these flashbacks of the past call into question the agency of other Tenno throughout the system. It is clear that our Tenno is the main force and instrumental in major events, but it clearly indicates that there are, canonically, other Tenno alive and operating throughout the system. We have, of course, known of this with both Rel and the lone Tenno operatives during survival missions, but the new war quest highlights their presence in an even greater capacity. Whether these other Tenno are fully aware of how they are tied to their Warframes, or if they are still stuck within the Second Dream, it is uncertain. However, as clearly seen during the beginning of the New War with the fallen Rhino Warframe in the Plains of Eidolon, there are, at the very least, numerous other active agents. Again, this information is not particularly new, but it is noteworthy as another of the few examples where other Tenno have a direct, mentioned story presence. Returning to the timeline of the quest, the Drifter fails to retrieve all three cores needed to revitalize Nata. With two offered, Nata is given enough strength to pursue her vengeance, and embarks despite the protests of the Drifter and the Operator, and before she can be completely healed. It is also shown in this brief scene how, as the Operator and the Drifter realign within a singular timeline, that the Drifter briefly gains control of the Tenno powers that they seemingly lack likely a consequence of the two realities of the Tenno overlapping as they swap positions across dimensions. 
We then see that despite his grand empire and his total devotion from the veiled creatures of the origin system, that Ballas is empty. In truth, his greatest desire was the one thing he could never truly have, reciprocal love. Cruel and twisted as the Orokin were, the idea of love evaded them throughout their endless lives, and when Ballas finally found it, it consumed him. When he then destroyed the one and only thing he ever truly loved, and that ever truly loved him in return, he was crushed. All his efforts and machinations then were either attempts to somehow return it, emulate it, or usurp it with grander goals, and yet they all failed or fell flat. The wound in his soul remained, and within it, resentment festered. Convinced that even a system-spanning empire is not enough to sate his appetite for adoration, he turns his sights on a grander goal. Tau. The one place that was meant to be the next evolution on humanity's journeys throughout the stars, and the grand culmination of his efforts that began all the way back with the events described in the Crewman Synthesis. Tau was to be the next step in the Orokin Empire's grand journey, and now, believing himself to be the last of his kind, Ballas believes it to be waiting patiently for him to assume his rightful place as its ruler. Driven mad by his desires, he convinces himself that the only way to finally be rid of the longing within him is to ascend to this new height on the ashes of everything that shackles him to the past. Thus, he will fuel his journey with the origin system, namely by consuming the massive power contained within soul itself. The operator, now aware of the drifter and their dual realities, seeks out the Zeraman to confront them. Switched with the drifter, they explore the derelict of the Zeraman in a drifting tomb that is displaced from time. It seems that while the Zeraman does exist in physical space somewhere, it is ravaged by the void and as a sort of temporal wedge in reality itself. Aboard this derelict, time has no meaning and the void leaks into our reality in the form of monstrous energies resembling humans formed of the same materials the plains of Duviri seem to be made of. It is possible these effigies are what remains of the Zeraman adults, twisted and warped by the void, though this is uncertain and they seem more to be simply facsimiles by the void as it probes reality, a sort of crude mimicry of the things it encounters similar to what Albrecht encountered when he first journeyed into the void. Here the Tenno also encounters a mask hanging from a tree that is identical to the one shown in the Plains of Duviri trailer. Much like the Drifter's idle whistling, this serves as yet another teaser towards the future content that will come with the aforementioned expansion. Upon meeting with the Drifter, the operator is told several things regarding the split realities. First is that the Drifter is seemingly privy to the events the Tenno has gone through and is very likely to have been viewing their counterparts actions from Duviri through some method. This explains how they are at least slightly aware of what must be done upon being swapped with the Operator, but are not completely sure of the specifics of the system at large. This also indicates that they are used as a sort of pawn by the Void, a failsafe in case the Void's primary anchor to reality, the Operator, is catastrophically injured or disrupted. This shows a level of deliberate action and planning on the part of the Void, which is unprecedented and a dire indication of what the future may hold. Granted, this swapping action may simply be a side effect of the Tenno's split reality needing to maintain a constant presence, but it does at least bring up the question of how exactly active the Man in the Wall is with utilizing our Tenno's dual forms. Lastly, the Tenno is told that only one of them can exist as a constant as a single time. It is here that the player can choose which manifestation completes the remainder of the quest. The chosen Tenno form then assaults the Tower of the Unum to stow away aboard a docked murex that is harvesting the Tower's Temple Kuva. Upon reaching its summit, it is revealed that the Unum is indeed still alive and aware, and is indeed an individual that has utilized transference to merge themselves with a non-humanoid entity similar to the Silver Grove. Though the Unum has been weakened too much to resist the Sentient's exploitation without the Tenno's help, in a brief display of her remaining power, she creates a localized temporal disturbance before bidding the Tenno to continue on their quest. On the path to the main fleet and the mothership Pragasa, the Tenno briefly reunites with Sai, 
and then encounters Era. Disillusioned with Ballas' madness, Era guides the Tenno to the final Archon Core. Era is then crushed by falling debris, but whether or not he survives is left ambiguous. With the last key to returning Nata to her full power, the Tenno embarks to confront both her and Ballas. Ballas, in another feeble attempt to exert control over the simulacrum of his old love, commands Nata to kneel before him. While his first attempt fails, he succeeds when he leverages his sentient biology to consume the third Archon core brought by the Tenno. During this final conflict between Nata, the Tenno, and Ballas, we get a better look at Ballas' perverted sense of control and the dynamics of his love towards Nata. Desperate for even a simulacrum of his old love, he intended to inspire devotion in the Mimic Queen by forcing her to kill her only attachment. The Parasesis was originally intended to drive her to him when her beloved surrogate children turned on her, orchestrated by him and cementing that Ballas is the only true source of comfort. The myriad emotional and psychological plots and manipulations of Ballas in the pursuit of adoration that lead all the way back to the time of the Orican are twisted, detailed, and worthy of their own analysis, but for now, we shall return to the quest at hand. Disgusted with the reflection of his own failures, and desperate to deflect any lingering blame that may be within himself, Ballas moves to strike down Nata, but is ambushed by the Tenno who places a veil upon him. Seeing his true desire, Margulis, he gives in to the illusion completely, allowing Nata to draw both the final Archon core and the control of Pragasa out from within Ballas, killing him and granting Nata full power once again. The celebration is short-lived, however, as Pragasa has gathered enough energy to open the Void Jump portal to Tau. The ensuing tear is enough to steal Nata's desperate cry to the Tenno from her lips, as reality itself is drawn inward towards the massive Void Space portal. Color and form begin to draw inwards, and Nata does the best she can to close the portal and keep the energy of the Void at bay. But from within the depths of the Void, something far more sinister emerges. The true form of the Void's conscience, the man in the wall, a massive Vitruvian sculpture that bellows requiems as it approaches. Its severed finger, the multi-reality object utilized by reliquary drives can be seen, as well as the mockery of our operator riding upon its head. The man in the wall's appearance may be that of Albrecht, the first creature it imitated and sought to replace. Additionally, while this may be somewhat of a stretch, the two slots in its forehead may be that of the Void Key's design. Though again, this may merely be coincidence. The exact words the god says are a matter of some debate, but one of the more common interpretations seems to be Ul, Rhys, Zata, Vom, Netra, Lok. The Requiem descriptions for these can then in turn be interpreted as a description of Arteno's journey. Other interpretations of the Void Speech may indicate new Requiem phrases entirely or combinations of others. Whatever the true speech is, it seems to me that the Requiem phrases are far more than simply isolated basic words, and potentially indicate a new form of eldritch language that can communicate entire concepts with a single phrase, and may only be a small part of a full lexicon. The man in the wall then vanishes, along with the portal he emerged from. While some theories indicate he possessed the Lotus, this seems unlikely given her nature as a sentient and their weaknesses to the Void. Other theories believe that the Man in the Wall is now freed from the Void, present in grander form within our system. And of course, other theories still are of the opinion that he simply appeared and then returned to the Void with no further ramifications as of yet, but clearly indicating that he is more of a threat than before. While I personally subscribe to the third theory, it is clear that this event serves mostly as a teaser for the Deviri Paradox, and whatever long-term consequences of the Man in the Wall's full appearance may be, they will likely be addressed then. With the collapse of Soul halted, and the Grand Portal to Tau closed, Nita collapses, and is brought back to safety by the Tenno. In a direct, poetic mirroring of the events and dialogue at the conclusion of the Second Dream, Nita is comforted by the Tenno, and her fractured personality brought into focus. As a mimic, her true self has been in constant flux, perhaps never truly existing. 
She also is briefly asked about what she saw when the void portal opened. She quickly dismisses it as nothing, but is clearly lying. As Nata herself claimed during the Ropalolist encounter, she has seen the wall's other face, and is aware of its existence. Her nothing could therefore be a poorly veiled attempt to dismiss the question out of fear, or could perhaps be interpreted to be similar to how Cephalons perceived the void, as a literal point of nothing, not a space of blackness or lack of objects, but a true, unfathomable gap in reality itself, as Tenno are implied to be the only ones able to truly perceive the nature of the void. Admittedly, this second interpretation is far-reaching, and her curt response is most likely simply to be fearful attempt to move past the topic. With the guiding words of her child, the one she could never have herself, she is able to quiet the voices of her multiple personalities and finally accept who she truly is. But the system is not at peace. Whatever semblance of alliance may have been brought on by the sentience, it has now been fractured, and the remains of the Narmer devotees have introduced an additional threat to the system. Further, the eldritch god that lies within the void grows more emboldened than ever, and seems no longer content to toy with reality from within its prison. But until the doors to the plains of Duviri are opened, and we are forced to confront what lies beyond the veil, this is what we know.